poverty and social issues. There is a lot of poverty within the Indian community. But we have to consider the cultural context. It's so much like it's so much like an iceberg. If you meet an indigenous person from Canada with a shirt with, with, a, with a tie and a suit, you may think, okay, somewhat like me. But there's 500 years of contact between Europeans and indigenous peoples. There are a lot of economic and social indicators in their communities which are very, very desperate. Uh, we have these things called uh, we have these things called the residential school where the children of uh, children of indigenous peoples were taken away in uh, religious based institutions far from their homes. And as an example, we had the uh, Indian Asian, an Indian reserve. The Indian Asian was someone who looked after every aspect of that person's life on a reserve. When they leave, when they get from in, even if they could buy an agricultural implement, they had to get permission from the Indian Asian for marrying, for everything. So that person sitting across from you at a table negotiating may have a history that is quite different from yours with respect to language, culture, their kids, hope, oh, sense of future, and this is the only chance that their community may have to move forward. Here's a quote from uh, Dene, who is upstream of the oil sands, or actually downstream from the oil sands. The, they're going to be talking about a pipeline that is being scheduled to be built uh, through uh, Alberta and British Columbia for a project that's going to uh, take oil to China, perhaps. Anyways, there's opposition, and this is very typical of the opposition of many of the First Nations in the areas downstream, and it's about affinity and cultural attributes of the land. Now, if, you look at, if you're coming from industry, there's a lot of pressures within the, the, the corporate world on the oil sands. Basically, we are asking industry, do you want to be seen as an intruder, a good neighbor, or a capacity builder? Now, just recently, the indigenous groups from uh, the Los Angeles Alberta were in The Hague just uh, 10 days ago, making a demonstration to uh, Shell at the annual general meeting of Shell. So, this is getting very international and very political. Shell, though, sees the view of indigenous peoples, they have a, their own ethnic policy. We talked about ethnic yesterday, free, prior, informed consent. Shell sees their attachment to ethnic in this way because it's a genuine source of differentiation from our competitors. We also have the report of James and Aya. And Aya, I really encourage you to have a look at this report. It is an international study of how indigenous peoples have been affected by extractive sectors around the world. Basically, the UN is, is concluding that consent and proper consultation is still not being done in indigenous communities. And Hernando de Soto, the person you must be familiar with him, a famous uh, economist who looks after land issues in Latin America. If people don't, if indigenous people don't get a sense of their legal rights, they will disappear as homeless. We talked about ethnic class here yesterday. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but ethnic is becoming the next wave in development practice for impact assessment and for extractive sector. So today, looking at the financial crisis, it's not over. It's still rippling through the world. Lenders are concerned about repayment companies, about profit. And the demographics of indigenous peoples in Canada and all over the world are very much the same. 50% of indigenous youth is under 25. And many of those are jobless. So there is a cultural issue that we have to address. So it's very important to engage now and early to avoid problems in the future. There are many, many handbooks and guidelines. Here's just four of, uh, of the hundreds of sort of guidelines that we're now familiar with on the extractive sector and how to do business in a more responsible way. I also encourage you to look at the report of John Rooney. John Rooney is the UN Special Rapporteur. He was the Special UN Rapporteur on Human Rights and business. He produced a report in 2011. It's on the web. It's very interesting. It goes into the financial aspects of good consultation and why it should be done well for the financial aspects of the corporation. There's a greater principles process. The World Bank and IMC are very active in, in this issue. And just an example, the bottom of Canada has got an impact benefit to an agreement community toolkit. We welcome you to go to that to see how Canada is responding to these sort of corporate indigenous peoples uh, agreements. The World Resources Institute says really that community relations can make or break the financial investment for a corporation. Now we're into the oil sands. 
There's a, a brief map uh, out of oil sands, that's Alberta. The yellow is the oil sands area. And uh, it's a huge, huge deposit of oil. 178 billion barrels of oil. Massive. Second only to Saudi Arabia. But it's extremely difficult to extract. The anticipated output by 2015 will be 3.5 million barrels per day. There is no exploration risk. You just dig. You don't have to spend $100 million on an exploration well. The oil is 50 feet beneath you, locked up in the sand. It's a very long project life, 50 years, very good for a return on investment. And very well in markets. The United States consumes 800,000 barrels a day just for the military. And that can, that can easily be supplied by the oil sands of Canada. So there's a political dynamic in, in this as well. It's a secure supply of oil for the U.S. military. Also, the value of the oil sands to Canada, by 2015, Alberta will see $2.5 billion in royalties per year. The federal government will get $3.5 billion in taxes. So we may complain about the oil sands, people may have their views about the oil sands, but it provides a definite economic incentive in the form of education, funds for education, funds for social services, in Canada and Alberta. Why the attention? Well, there's just one, one example of a of a tailings uh, a strip, a disturbed zone. These can be seen from, from space. It's one of the largest industrial complexes in the world when it comes to disturbed areas. It's a huge, huge, basically, it's a cultural, technical experiment that has gone wild with no conclusion. We don't know how this is going to play out. It's, it's really an uncontrolled experiment in industrial development. Some of the core issues. Well, there are many. Acidic emissions, uh, greenhouse gases, water, and so on. Flow rates to the Athabasca River. It takes three barrels of three barrels of water to produce one barrel of oil. All this water comes from the Athabasca for groundwater, for groundwater aquifers that support the Athabasca. Cumulative effects on groundwater, tailings, ponds, on health, land reclamation. Some of these have been discussed already in previous uh, uh, discussions. The boom town issues, the stresses on boom towns. EI methods have come into this. A lot of uh, the Royal Society of Canada, the Auditor General of Canada, have uh, looked very closely at the oil sands and concluded that some of the technical studies being done on monitoring and the environmental assessments of these are not very good quality and there's no coordination among industry about the, the whole industrial footprint of this. On the First Nations, the consultation issues, the session just before this, there was uh, Mitchell McCormick talking about Treaty 8 and the issues with uh, respect to First Nations and how Treaty 8 obligations are not being respected through the way industrial development is, is accelerating. Uh, migratory waterfall, Companies uh, that kill migratory birds because birds land in the tailings ponds are subject to fines by the Canadian government because of uh, our legislation with respect to migratory birds. Uh, government response to reports, some people say the reports are not being taken seriously. Data is not public enough. There is not really a, a comprehensive monitoring program throughout the oil sands. And public relations. This is a public relations juggernaut. This is huge. It's international. It's on the same scale as, as the Chad Cameron pipeline. It's on the same scale as Three Gorges. And how industry and government and First Nations manage the message is really what is going to be the issue of the next couple of years. The European Union is involved. As you know, the European Parliament will be voting soon on whether or not oil from the uh, oil sands of Canada will be deemed uh, a dirty oil and not uh, subject to, to uh, import by, by Europe. Bank of Canada is involved in this as well. They have signed up onto a policy where they will not lend money to industry in the oil sands area unless the free requirement and consent has been taken into account. And just a few other companies listed under there, Rio Tinto and Exo and so on, Extrata. They also do have, uh, have pick, uh, policies. Trying, trying, they're, they're very trying very hard to engage with First Nations communities. With respect to the, the, the real issues of First Nations, it's, it's mainly about uh, one of the key ones is cancer. Now, downstream, 
there are reports that cancer rates are accelerating. Different and very specific types of cancers within the thyroid, in various parts of the body that are not seen elsewhere. A lot of people are debating whether or not this is statistically significant, but the communities themselves are noticing an increase in cancer. Water withdrawals on the Athabasca. Climate change is not factoring into this because the Athabasca is a, a glacier-fed uh, water system, and if, if climate change does affect a lot of the watersheds in Canada in a negative way, will that affect withdrawal rates on the Athabasca River, where, as I said before, you need three barrels of oil, three barrels of water to produce one barrel of oil, and constitutionally protected rights. Uh, treaty 8 area, this is a treaty 8 area, and under treaty 8 it does say that the First Nations of treaty 8 area, which all these people are, are, are where they live, are supposed to have free access to their territories and not have any sort of impingement by industry on their activities, but that is happening. Their ways of life are being, are being threatened. 20,000, about 23,000 people live in this area. Um, I mentioned cancer. I want to also mention the positive benefits. It's the, the indigenous peoples, when I say indigenous people have, have um, employment, social, cultural problems, that is true. But I'm not going to leave you with, leave you with the, the, uh, the image that every indigenous person in Canada is, a, is a struggling. There are very successful indigenous corporations in this country. There's, there's judges, there's lawyers, there's doctors, there's pilots, there's actors, there's playwrights. There's every type of discipline and every type of business in First Nations community. Some are more subject to um, economic uh, disincentives because of their location or education and things like this. Fort McKay is a dead center, is in the bullseye of the oil sands area. And it's benefiting uh, very much, even though it's an economic disadvantaged community, it's benefiting very much from the industry incentives to employment, uh, contract work and so on. $800 million in contract work. That's very good. $3.7 billion uh, in contracts for the last 11 years for indigenous companies in the area. That's, that's very significant. 1,600 indigenous people are employed in the area. So when employment rates go from zero to almost 1%, that is extremely important. And Fort McKay Group is six companies owned by the first, uh, Fort McKay First Nation, which has $100 million in annual revenue. This is not uh, a chicken feed. But really, this slide here, I think to me, is what wraps up the issues for me as a Canadian in the oil sands. This is a conversation that happened just a couple of weeks ago between Ajuar Peru, this delegation that came to Canada to visit the First Nations in Fort McKay, to understand what's going on with industrial development in their communities so that the actual when they go back home can understand and learn from Canadian First Nations. So, the first quote is, now there are 20 plants and everyone has a job, but there are no fish in the lakes and we haven't seen a moose in, year, in years. The actual say, how do you eat? And the First Nations from Canada say, we go to the store. Has your economic situation improved? Money is there, but we fight over it nonstop. Nobody trusts each other. Do your children get a better education? Good enough to work for oil companies. So, think back to that original quote from Duncan Campbell Scott from the 1930s who essentially said, we want to get the Indian out of the Indian. We want to assimilate the Indian issue in Canada. That was in the 1930s. Now, I'm not going to say that that's what the policy of Canada is right now. It isn't. We have constitutionally protected rights. Indigenous rights are, are protected in the Canadian Constitution. But, when it comes to a situation like this, where the landscape itself is changing in such a dramatic pace. For once there was royal forts, now there are Kevin's ponds. For once there was moose, now there's Kevin's ponds and things like this. The livelihoods and the cultural practices of these people is changing very, very quickly. So to the point of, yes, they have jobs. Yes, they have income. But do they still have cultural integrity? Have they been now assimilated into a modern 21st century economy where, yes, they're working, they, they call themselves Chippewa, and they call themselves Dene, they call themselves Cree, but can they actually identify who they are with respect to those cultural attributes when working for an oil company? 
There is much fuel for the fire. I draw your attention to the Northern Gateway Pipeline Project. The, I mentioned this yesterday in another discussion. The Northern Gateway Pipeline Project is, is, the, is the three gorges project of Canada. It is a 1,600 kilometer pipeline which is intended to be built from the West Sands through Alberta down to uh, Kitimat in British Columbia. And as, as we know, oil flows towards money. And this, this oil is to be sold to, uh, to Asia, to China. That's fine. Uh, the Chinese, uh, China has $15 billion invested in the oil sands. That's free market, that's fine. They're entitled to do that. So I think they would like to see some of those returns going back to China, and that's fine. That's what business is about. But 100 First Nations in Canada have signed the Fraser Declaration. These are bands in Northern Alberta and British Columbia where the pipeline is intended to go. The Fraser Declaration essentially states, regardless of the laws of Canada, regardless of the constitutional rights, this pipeline will not be built through our territory. And as well, there's 43,000 salmon fishermen within the inlet where this terminal is supposed to go. And they say there is no way that we want to Exxon Valdez risk for our livelihoods. If there's one spill, there's going to be 200 super tankers going through this inlet every year, double hull and all this kind of thing, yes, very secure, but it's one of the most dangerous waterways in Canada. So, real plus money is coming up, the green growth uh, issue is, is, uh, is moving forward. Uh, I don't know how this is going to play out. It, as I said before, the, 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 the gateway project and the oil sands is very much an experiment that is, is uncontrolled. We don't know how it's going to play out. The North Gateway project, I think, will be a litmus test for rights, responsible development, and so on. I'm sure you're going to hear about this in your own country's back home. It is, it is getting a lot of international press, and uh, I welcome I welcome everybody to, to keep involved with the Gateway project and see if we can learn from that from your own mega projects in your own homes uh, where you might have indigenous peoples or local communities who could benefit from a project but also have uh, social, economic, and health concerns. Thank you very much. Hold your questions or comments till the end, that would perhaps be the best. Because the idea at the end of the session is to have a bit of a panel discussion where the presenters, you know, will be, will be up here and available for, for questions and answers and so on, but also general discussion. So it doesn't have to be linked to this particular presentation. So if that's okay, then uh, I'll ask you to introduce the next presenter and then we'll, we'll move on with the program. Thank you. The next presenter. Uh, the test of whether a 
proposal is acceptable or not is whether it makes a positive contribution to sustainability uh, while avoiding significant adverse effects. Uh, to do that kind of analysis, it's necessary to be comprehensive of the kinds of factors that may be influential. So, in the usual language, social, economic, biophysical factors all get considered together and their interrelationships are included. We look for the long term, we look for the cumulative effects. So, it's the full suite of, of issues that are significant. Secondly, it's crucial to compare alternatives. It's not presumed that there's some line that can be identified. Here we have unacceptable, and here we have acceptable. What we're really trying to do is find the best option that will provide the most positive sustainability effects for the least risk. And the kinds of benefits that are pursued are ones that we would like to have as mutually reinforced trying to avoid trade-offs, but rather have social, economic, cultural, other kinds of effects that are positive and mutually supportive. At least that's the ideal. Uh, so uh, the simple approach is we're looking further ahead and we're being less stupid. Um, we have looked at these two cases from a process perspective and for a, from a substantive requirements, uh, objectives, perspective, and we'll have a framework that has that. Uh, so the process elements that we're looking for in these cases um, involve some things that are particular to the circumstance. Both Australia and Canada have uh, federal jurisdictions. There are multiple scales of governance. In particular, Canada would be the federal and the provincial, and in Australia is the Commonwealth and the state. It's the same basic story. And we also, in both cases, have Aboriginal interests and have some governments and governance authority. So, one of the criteria for process is that you can find some way to integrate those jurisdictional powers in ways that are somewhat coherent and efficient. Secondly, it's important that any of these kinds of assessments to define the mandate and requirements that very early so that proponents walking into the process have some idea of what they're supposed to do. And having uh, sustainability requirements defined reasonably early is particularly important because it's unfamiliar. Comparing the alternatives in, in, the, in the light of explicit criteria, uh, we'll get into the criteria in a minute, um, is a fundamental element. Our experience has been that the most uh, motivated and effective reviewers of any proposed project are public interest organizations and, and public individuals, not governments. Uh, occasionally competing proponents are interesting contributors, but by and large, the assessment works effectively as a critical process only after significant and effective public engagement. And it's important that these decisions be authoritative in the end concentrates the attention of the participants and that the conclusions can be enforced. So those are the kind of process elements we're interested in. We're also interested in some sustainability-based substantive requirements moving in the right direction uh, in various ways. And, and the book that we did some time ago sets out generically in a global sense what kind of things we need to move towards sustainability. Uh, they can organize and phrase in a variety of different ways. But the basic ideas are uh, uh, fairly obvious, I think. The problem is that those uh, are very generic global terms. You have to specify criteria for particular circumstances. A hydrocarbon project uh, is significantly different from lots of other sectors, but only because we're dealing with non-renewable resources. Consequently, uh, there is no possibility that those undertakings are going to be sustainable themselves. Nor will they contribute to sustainability, except insofar as that opportunity represented by a depleting resource can be used to build a bridge to something that's more sustainable in the long run. So one of the big tests that's peculiar to non-renewable resource extraction projects is whether that is designed in some way that it builds a bridge to a more uh, sustainable future. 
That doesn't happen automatically, clearly. Uh, it has to be something that's designed into how it is managed. So that's one of the crucial factors. Another crucial factor is that that kind of legacy building is something that doesn't come automatically through what a proponent does. It's more often what governments do with the revenues and the opportunities that are represented by this case. So when you do a review, often the recommendations that are being made are not being made simply to a licensing body and, and into the conditions of approval for the proponent, but rather if they are recommendations for the governments should do uh, to ensure that the uh, arrangements are made that uh, revenues are collected and redistributed and uh, used for various purposes, for example. So those are right up, as you can see for yourself here. Uh, so we have a, a framework for looking at these two cases and some of the considerations of the process ones I've mentioned, some of the ones are substantive ones that I've mentioned. Um, and the substantive ones are specified for hydrocarbon kinds of activities, especially ones that are related to construction, construction undertakings that have really a, uh, not only a life expectancy for the boss question, but also they have a major construction period at the beginning, which employs way more people than the operation stage. So you have immediate food loss in the long run. A bunch of details that we can't get into in the ground of this organization. Right, so I'm going to talk briefly about the McKenzie case uh, in Canada and uh, Jen's going to talk about the Browse case in uh, Western Australia. The, the McKenzie pipeline is basically uh, an area of this north of, of the tar sands that Peter saw. Uh, the McKenzie River flows for about a thousand kilometers from northern Alberta <coughs> to the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and uh, it is a traditional transportation corridor. It's also a corridor uh, proposed uh, a couple of times now over the last 30 years for pipelines to take uh, gas, particularly from the Arctic Ocean area in the Kansas Delta uh, south to uh, existing pipelines in Alberta. This particular proposal was made a decade ago. Uh, 1,200 kilometers of pipelines, uh, gas uh, gathering system to take gas from three initial fields and uh, several other ones after that, multiple billions uh, anticipated cost, um, but also because it provides the first export link for uh, fields that are now not served by any exit for the produced product. Uh, it would induce much more development, and how much more development than is a crucial factor in this case. Um, and that meant that the effective alternatives in the case were uh, not just whether to have the project or not, so no alternative or what was proposed, but what pace and scale of development should be allowed. Pipeline is initially, was initially designed so that it would carry uh, Point uh, eight. Um, this is wrong. It should say 0.83 billion cubic feet per day was the base case with the three fields. Uh, but it was expandable in the initial design to 1.8 billion. Uh, the three fields would serve the 0.83. The uh, additional fields that would be expanded additional exploration and gas development to fill a pipeline to carry 1.8 billion cubic feet per day are ones that have not been identified. There would be further cumulative effects that were anticipated in the design of the pipeline. So there's a big issue about uh, what level of cumulative effects, positive and negative, could be managed, uh, which ones would be great benefits that could be captured effectively by the region. How fast do you want to exploit those things? So many of the serious effects in this case were dependent on how fast and how large uh, the project is allowed to be. Um, so uh, what happened in this case was that the federal, provincial, and aboriginal authorities reached an agreement to have a joint public review panel 
that would hold public hearings in all the communities, uh, and that would issue a joint report uh, into the decision-making process. Uh, and then it would report to the national regulator on such matters. The mandate established in the terms of reference for that panel was a sustainability mandate. In other words, they were urged to, the panel members were urged to apply a positive contribution sustainability test, uh, which is basically, uh, will this undertaking leave the region uh, and with the broader Canadian interest in better shape than it found? Whether there be a positive legacy after all is said and done. Um, and that entailed looking at pace and scale alternatives, and so they compared various scales of development as the alternatives in light of an explicit set of sustainability based criteria that included some of the considerations I mentioned before, and came up with a series of recommendations for the relevant governments. Um, the process was difficult for a variety of reasons. Uh, it took longer than it should have done, um, and in part because governments were irritated by the lateness of the recommendations, but in part because the recommendations were very demanding of governments to do things like manage basic scale they're not very happy about doing. Most of the serious recommendations of the panel were rejected by the parliament governments. Um, but by the time, uh, partway through the process actually, it was found that the amount of gas available from other sources, uh, from an environmental perspective, questionable sources that involved fracking uh, technology, uh, there was a lot more gas closer to markets than had been anticipated by the proponents, uh, and the gas from the Arctic would not have been economically viable uh, and it's not economically viable now, and it's not clearly economically viable for another decade. So uh, the panel in the end became more or less irrelevant because of the economic factors beyond the control of this, this whole exercise. So we won't know what the actual impact of all these decisions would be because it's been taken out of, uh, out of the hand. Uh, but it is as an example Applied explicit sustainability based criteria in a case where there are multiple alternatives compared in light of those criteria in a public exercise. It is the best example of this happened in Canada, uh, certainly, um, and given the current government's uh, inclinations, it will be the last one we see for quite some time, I guess. Uh, the Browse case. Jack. Thanks, Bob. So just a brief introduction to the Browse case, for those who may not be familiar with it. Proposal is a multi-user energy processing company brewing in the Trinity region of Western Australia, and we don't give the insurance of more or less without our red circuit is. So the proposal is that this hub will be available for more than one component, normally two at the moment, um, to process gas from the Browse offshore fields. The, the proposal includes processing, storage, workers accommodation, and light industrial area report and various supporting infrastructure. It's highly controversial. It's in the Kimberley region, which has, um, has very limited industrial development to date. There are environmental and heritage values um, so perceived and probably real social impacts on the, the community of Broome, which is about 60 kilometres away, which is a, one of Western Australia's trees and hot spots. And there's also a large indigenous community in this area. So those communities suffer many of the many of the issues that Peter mentioned in his presentation with regard to the discrepancies between indigenous and non-indigenous communities in Australia. <coughs> So what's really interesting about this is that it's a government initiative to have this hub and the idea is to be able to avoid ad hoc development, so having all the individual components come and propose on their own sites within this, within this currently pristine region. So for, the, for this, um, the reason itself is the Department of State Development is the component on behalf of the West Australian Government. And Woodside Energy Limited has signed an agreement with the government to be the foundation project component and as such, they've played a significant role in the assessment process that I'll talk about now. <coughs> so this has been quite a long, ongoing process. It was a, a process originally initiated by government to look at alternative sites um, for this development. And those sites in the community and outside the community are considered in that process. 
Clinical adaptive shortlist of four, the Environmental Protection Authority provided uh, some advice on those four sites. The government had a key preferred site that James Price pointed to that since he told me this all the room. That site's now been identified as the, as the preferred site. It is now subject to a, an assessment by, by both the state and the government, state and commonwealth governments. And that's an assessment of a strategic proposal. So it's going through a different part of the Environmental Protection Act community <coughs> project proposal. And that's very significant because it means that the conditions that are applied at strategic level assessment stage will apply to projects that come along afterwards to be developed on that precinct if they declare the right proposals, which essentially if they're LNG plants then that probably will be. And of course, this is all fairly new territory and fairly new processes in Western Australia. <laughs> so the strategic assessment report was prepared by the Department of State Development as a proponent. We have a very strong biophysical EIA and impact assessment process in Western Australia, but no history and no or very little history and no current legal requirements for social impact assessment. So it's very difficult for us to conceptualise and assess these projects within the sustainability framework without social. In this case, it's becoming increasingly um, this has been increasingly recognised as a problem and a lot of private project proponents with big resource companies actually undertake voluntary SIAs anyway, even though there's no legal process to actually assess and evaluate that. And in this case, um, I think to, to their credit, the Department of State Learning also undertook a social impact assessment. As well as that, there was a separate Aboriginal social impact assessment that was commissioned by the Kimberley Land Council, which is um, the traditional owner body for that area. So at the moment, we're um, awaiting the Environmental Protection Authority report on that. Um, and then subsequently the Commonwealth Federal Government review. So we'll now just um, hold on, this problem has come back, so we'll do our tag team thing. Um, and so using the framework that Bob presented earlier, so we'll um, just highlight some of the interesting similarities and differences between these case studies. <coughs> some of this we've covered. Uh, implicitly already, this is organized as in the chart. Um, both of these cases were very major in scale, and both of them involved a joint process <coughs> that was based on agreement among parties. And in some ways, the Browse case was earlier in a uh, more anticipatory exercise by governments who came together to uh, establish the idea of a single precinct uh, for LG activities uh, before the industry had uh, started into its detailed proposals. Um, whereas the Kenzie case really did respond to a government uh, to an industry proposal that was being developed. So that's an early involvement. The Browse case was probably uh, superior. The uh, the scope of both of them was reasonably uh, narrow in the uh, focus on regional as opposed to all activities that would include the national interest. Um, the Mackenzie case was very much uh, focused on the regional effects within the Mackenzie Valley, which is a very large region, but it doesn't include very effectively uh, national considerations. The panel wrestled with how it dealt with the greenhouse gas implications of this major hydrocarbon project, for example. Um, on the matter of, uh, of looking at the range of effects, I'll leave Jenny to talk about the Browse case, but the McKinsey case was exemplary in the extent to which it was quite comprehensive of everything that mattered in evaluating whether this was a desirable project or not. The weak areas were of the sort of national global interest questions which the panel had wrestled with, although we could attempt to deal with those matters. The Browse case? The fundamental difference was that there's no explicitly invoked sustainability mandate in the Browse process, although there's been lots of studies, including all of the expected environmental studies, social impact assessment, um, and some social economic studies. This, um, the integration of those into the concept of sustainability to put the overall sustainability project isn't there. And, and when there isn't a fully integrated assessment, looking at the cross effects among social, economic, and cultural, and physical matters, uh, the absence of that integrated 
basis for analysis makes it much more difficult to do a comparison of alternatives. In the McKenzie case, the comparison of alternatives, at least in the sense of the pace and scale alternatives, was central to the analysis. Uh, there was the parallel uh, in the Browse case, for Yeah, I think the um, McKenzie was exemplary in different development scenarios, which, which Boundary didn't do. And the strength of Browse was that it did do um, significant alternative science, but that's really where the alternatives were <coughs> The McKenzie case did find, however, that though they took that approach, because cumulative effects were at the center of their assessment, because they were trying to look ahead to the legacies of these projects over quite a long term. Uh, they were limited in the data they had before them because the component, of course, was presenting information on what they wanted to do and associated cumulative effects of that particular proposal. But if the pace and scale alternatives were multiple, uh, getting information about the implications of different bases and scales, the scenarios that would have arisen with the more uh, intense and larger scale options it was not really available in the evidence that came before the panel. So one of the lessons drawn from that was that in these major kinds of undertakings, it's often a very useful thing to have some portion of the research leading before the assessment to involve development of alternative future scenarios. Not just forecasting, but desirable scenarios from which you can do backcasting, so that there could be some better sense of what the implications of various scales of options would be. Uh, I guess the, the, the final elements here have to do with uh, the involvement of, of the public uh, and other stakeholders. The McKenzie case involved public hearings. It involved some minor funding of public interest interveners in those discussions, uh, and they played significant roles in producing material uh, that was of use to the panel in this evaluation. I think the, as we can better say that the public involvement in the Browse assessment was significantly less than it was in McKenzie because there was, it wasn't this idea of the panel holding independent hearings and so it was very much restricted to public comment although the Aboriginal social impact assessment process I mentioned before was, was far more consultative. We'll move on to the substantive elements. Um, I think I'll just cover this briefly in the case of the McKenzie. Um, because the McKenzie case did have a explicit set of criteria based on their sustainability mandate, and those criteria were specified for the particular circumstance, not only of hydrocarbon development, but also of hydrocarbon development in this particular region. They had an explicit framework that was based on basically those uh, considerations that are on the left-hand column. So that was the fundamental basis for the McKenzie analysis. They had some limitations in, in carrying out the analysis on those grounds, but they adopted all five. And I think trying to do this comparison to see to what extent Browns addressed those things was also even more difficult because it wasn't the actual framework within, the, um, within which the assessment was conducted as it was for McKenzie. So those, those issues were given explicit consideration in McKenzie and Browns it was a little bit more hit and miss. For example, we, um, the, the assessment process didn't even induce impacts, it didn't look at potential future development scenarios in the Kimberley as a result of this project, which the McKenzie process did. Um, as far as boom and bus go, certainly construction boom effects were considered, but there was no real consideration of the pace and scale of development in the same way that there was with McKenzie. Pitching and legacy, um, there's, there's very much um, the idea in the Browse process that the development should aim and support the local indigenous community, so there's certainly bridging a legacy issue there. And there's also a passing reference to gas as a transition fuel. And I think um, intergenerational equity issues were well considered in the social impact assessment process. The government's capacity is interesting, it was a very major driver in McKenzie. Hasn't been so much a focus of the reviews in the, the Browse assessment, because again, there hasn't been this independent body that's actually had the mandate to look at, to look at the capacity of government and governance models to actually manage the process and the project once it's implemented. So I think that's actually quite a key fundamental difference. There are quite a lot of recommendations for government that came out of the McKenzie process. 
Um, and we've sort of yet to see, because we're past all halfway through, to see what, what the government's recommendations might be coming out of Browns. Um, just wrap this up quickly then. Um, what we've seen are proposals that are in their basic characteristics very similar, but approached in ways that were quite different. Uh, in some ways, the McKenzie analysis was more strategic, looking at a range of alternatives uh, at a regional futures level, uh, although the Browse one did start earlier with the government initiative. Um, both of them were the better practice than was called in the jurisdiction. Um, both of them uh, wrestled with the same kinds of questions, but in very different ways. So, uh, particularly different things were the sustainability mandate, the focus on cumulative effects and alternatives, the independent panel in the McKenzie case. Um, and efficiency concerns were faced uh, by both of them, perhaps more dramatically in the McKenzie instance. Um, both of them emphasized that there would be significant government implications for action in uh, a major project, uh, not just adjustments to the proponents' uh, conditions. So I think that it's safe to say that the cases that we have seen have demonstrated that multi jurisdictional cooperation is possible, that a sustainability based uh, approach to analysis can be undertaken, uh, that you need to design your regime to prepare for that. It's best if those criteria are clear from the outset for the proponents and the other participants. It's certainly helpful to have an independent public process, um, and that uh, doing that has broad benefits of, of, of learning and uh, expanding the possibilities and what gets attention that should be long-term benefits. Um, there are things that prove to be difficult, but I think probably the thing that has proved to be most difficult, uh, certainly in the McKenzie case, uh, is moving governments along to an agenda that's different from what they're used to, looks like it's going to push them into areas of activity and consideration that they haven't done before. Um, and they will use excuses like it's an inefficient decision-making process uh, as reason to avoid the substantive implications of, of what is present. The substantive implications uh, in a uh, world that is increasingly uh, treated badly by humans uh, are implications that will be increasingly faced, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, and governments are probably going to have to come up with the bar uh, whether they're happy about it or not. Uh, so, so these are examples that at least help us see what has been tested in practice and what has been possible and difficult. Thank you very much. are from the private sector window, that's how they came to the bank, and 
we had to engage the public sector window of the bank to ensure, I was glad to see, that sustainability cannot be really ensured only from the private sector uh, perspective. So, the projects we're going to talk about, you probably heard about, is the Capisea project and the Peru LNG project in, in Peru. They are both hydrocarbon projects, and the way we're structured, we're just going to talk about the principles that the bank adopted to be able to go uh, with the financing of these projects, and then a little bit of conclusions and lessons learned. One important aspect on this, um, these two projects for us was that the Camasea project was uh, approved in 2004, and the IDB did not have an environment and safeguards compliance policy approved. We didn't have to have it designed, let alone approved. And then the Rolling G project had, when we approved it in 2007, we had already approved the environment and safeguards compliance policy in 2006. So to work with the requirements in both projects was quite different because in the first one, the requirements had not, were not based in any policy requirement. So it was, we in a way had a much broader um, scope of requirements that we could impose. And on the other side, we had not much leverage because there was not something that we could say, well, we can only do it if you comply with your policy because we didn't have a policy at that time. So at the Gorilla G for ensuring sustainability, we had the back of a strong safeguards and compliance policy. So these were two different aspects that it's interesting to understand throughout the presentation. The Campesina project, as I told you, was approved in 2004 but the due diligence started in 2001. So it took us for a private sector project three years of due diligence. I'm sure that those of you or other bankers or private sector, you will understand that this is not a common process. Three years on a due diligence is very unusual. But because we didn't have leverage with the policy, it took us a long time for us to be able to convince the sponsors and to work with them and then to be able to, to really uh, engage in a sustainable framework. So the project had an upstream component, which had all the, um, the exploration and exploitation, the, the, where the gas was coming from, and the processing facilities, and the export plants. But none of the upstream was financed by the bank. The bank was only financing the downstream component, which was just uh, the natural gas pipeline and the liquid uh, pipeline. I'm going to show you the, the map, and then I'll come back to this one. So you see, these are the fields and the processing facilities. Okay. I can't see it anymore. <coughs> Anyways, I'll walk through because I can see the. So these are the processing facilities and the little square in the gas fields, and then the pipeline, the two pipelines. The gas pipeline will come to this point, the 740 kilometer, and the natural liquid pipeline will come to this point, which is the exit. And these facilities here, and those facilities at the, at the gas fields, are not part of the project financed by the bank. They are part of the upstream. So in the, in the previous one, this more or less easier to understand. The whole investment was almost two billion dollars. And the bank was only engaged in financing the natural gas liquid pipeline and the natural gas pipeline. It was uh, 800 million uh, dollars, but from those 800 million dollars, our portion was only. Nothing compared to the whole amount of the of the of the business. So getting leverage took us a, a long time. Um, so the, the, I showed you already the map, and these uh, we'll talk about the sustainable principles. We understood at the bank at the time that we would have to, even without having a policy, 
we would have to work our way through to get strong requirements. The Damasea project was a very controversial project. It was heavily um, had an opposition by international NGOs, by the U.S. Congress, when they were leveraging the U.S. Uh, Congress to vote against the project. It was a very, very, very controversial project. So the due diligence process for us, that took us three years. We started with the project design, and the, the project started to be built on the way during these three years. So we had to monitor the project during construction, even when we didn't have um, the development group. So convincing the, the sponsors to you know, pay for all this monitoring, and at the point we had a day-to-day -day monitoring, we had people on the field every day throughout the, the, the pipeline. It was really a, a very complicated process, but I think it paid off. On the transparency, we had to include a lot more consultation than it was uh, usually. We, in this project, was the first time that we, as the multilateral bank, we did our own consultation. Normally what you see is that the sponsor or the borrower will do their consultation, and that's what is the normal requirement under project finance. But in this case, the bank had to have a lot of consultation with the international NGOs. We did actually 13 meetings in the field with indigenous people, with um, the Indian people, uh, with governments, with all the stakeholders, including international NGOs. And the participation uh, process was really key. And one of the things we, we required for the first time was that the borrower establish a web page specifically for the project. In, in many projects, you already had this. But this project, the sponsor didn't have a uh, web page. So again, how do you leverage yourself to, to impose that without policy? There is no policy that says that. And we didn't have a policy or a requirement. But finally, the Camisea web page was created, and it became uh, really uh, fundamental to go ahead with the project. Because all the management plans, all the consultations, everything, BIAs, all the additional studies, everything was supposed to be Something, all the reports from the day-to-day -day monitoring were posted into this web page so people, and they were posted in both English and Spanish, so people from where all the world they could see and follow up. So, on the additionality of the bank, because this was a project that truly didn't need $75 million. They could get that from anybody, anywhere else. But we wanted to be engaged because we thought that we had a specific additionality to ensure sustainability that we wouldn't get anywhere otherwise if we were not involved. Because we could get the public sector window of the bank to really work with the government, which made the, the whole difference. Because most of the indirect, cumulative, and long-term impacts would not be managed by the private sector. They, these are things that have to be managed by the government. So it was uh, very important for us to work with the public sector window of the bank to develop this institutional strengthening loan for the government of Peru. And uh, that I will show you some of the things that were done, but I mean, we don't have time to do everything, talk about everything. And um, the additional thing that we were, would have a better leverage to work with the government to create new mechanisms for distribution of the benefits. Because by the time we engaged with this project in the legislation of Peru, the royalties would only go 50% to the federal government, and the other 50% would go to the department where the gas fields are located. So for the project that we were financing, which was the pipeline, and which would go through much more impacts during construction, heavy impacts, and if something during operation, if there was a spill, they would be bearing all the negative impacts. They would get nothing. And during our consultations with all these uh, departments along the pipeline route, the main thing they complained was about what are we getting from that? Everything is going to Cusco, where the, the, the gas is located. So for us, it was definite that we had to agree with the government had to make the government agree to change their royalty legislation 
to be able to distribute benefits also to the pipeline along, to the communities along the pipeline. So, and um, well, after doing a long process, we managed to to get this loan going on. And about and some of the aspects that were really fundamental was first the creation of this interinstitutional coordination group at the government, because at the time there were like 13 agencies responsible for different things. One responsible for monitoring, the other responsible for air quality monitoring, the other responsible for the indigenous people. Everything in a piecemeal. And the project was so big that you couldn't deal with it on a piecemeal type. You had to see it all together. So the first thing was creation of this group. Another very important aspect, I don't know why I put it at the end, maybe I forgot about is the Kakasea Ombudsman because of the issues around it and the, the need for transparency. The bank so, um, financed also the Kakasea Ombudsman only for this project, for the Kakasea project. And then another important area, and that's um, one, one of the reasons that the project was controversial, because the, the gas fields are partially located in areas that were reserved for people that were living in voluntary isolation. So for these people had no protected, the area was just reserved from them, for them. So the bank also worked to get a decree upgrading the legal protection creating a protection plan for them, health plan for them, a lot of other um, an anthropological um, contingency plan in case anyone was found near the project. So there was all an anthropological contingency plan designed specifically to protect them for, uh, for any undesired contact. So it was good to see that during construction and throughout operation, there has been maybe three or four uh, Side scenes of the um, well, of the isolated people, um, and then another important action was the creation of the sustainable development of the Paracas Bay because the the export facility that was not part of our project but <coughs> part of the upstream was located in a very polluted bay, which, however, was at the buffer zone of a national park. And so, although it was super polluted, it was in the buffer of the National Park. So a lot of people went against the project just because of that. They didn't want anything in, in the uh, buffer zone. However, in the buffer zone, there was already eight uh, fish meal plants, two, um, two um, terminals, and one port. So we said, okay, the only way we can do this is we can use the project to turn it around and transform this bay, which is polluted and going down each day, to a, to a, a clean bay. So there was another working together with the government and with all the stakeholders in the area, all the private sector who were working in the area, and they created this commission and put money, everybody with a little bit of money, and then the, the bay was clean. They created the pipelines that took all the fish meal uh, efforts that were polluting the bay. They clean it and, and now it's, um, it's not the discharge in the, the bay, the like in the shores anymore. And, um, and then also a lot of money was put into the, crea the creation of the management plan for this national park. So a lot of, of benefits came out of the, of the project. And the project itself it has no discharge. It's a zero discharge plan. So there's no, no impacts directly. And then we'll, we'll maybe talk about it a little bit later, but it was super important at this point because of the controversy around it to create a very early stage, a monitoring baseline, let's say the baseline for the monitoring of the quality of the, the bay from the very early stage together with the participation of the people and the fishermen that use the bay. So this was the first participatory um, monitoring process that started from the baseline, and then they, we also designed the required, uh, the design of a, of a mathematical model for the bay. So they participated in all the runnings of the mathematical model. They participate today, so it's now how many years? 10 years? Seven years. <laughs> Seven years of monitoring, and they still participate, and they're very happy to see that the, the bay has really improved. 
So another aspect was the light land piping because the pipeline was going through areas that were not piped, so you could, although the design was already made in a way that it would be very hard to create uh, access to unlocked areas, but still the other important mitigation measure was to do the land piping, so it was all, it would be all protected. On crossing natural habitats, so uh, we have we had very specific um, areas that the pipeline crossed from the rainforest to the highlands, which is the the Andes in the Peru, and we also the pipeline also went through the desert coast. So three different landscapes, three different um, sensitive habitats, uh, but on the wetlands, which were more prominent and in the rainforest, we had to design specific construction methods and just to be able to cross those, those wetlands without having a permanent impact. And well, the institutional capacity, uh, as I mentioned to you, was the first time that we made all these consultations for, I mean, from the bank perspective. And so the, the NGOs were, for the first time, able to dialogue, to have a dialogue directly with the government through the consultations that we were promoting. And it was the first time, so that enhanced also their ability to, to make their cases and to come forward and to be able to have a direct access to the government. So it was very important too. These are just pictures so that you know more or less how it looks like. Um, and some of the construction practices that had to be designed specifically, but just this illustration and how the the wetlands were fully recovered, which is glad and glad to see. And then um, the other project that came in 2007, which somehow was a development from the original Camisea, because these gas fields, now Peru has a different matrix. They found gas, and through the Camisea project, they became um, independent on hydrocarbon uh, needs. So they were first an imported, now they are exported. So Portland G came in 2007 and was just the liquefied uh, natural gas plant that was to be built. And they had the marine terminal and the breakwater, uh, and there, there was also uh, the pipeline that would bring the, the natural gas to the plant, and there was a quarry during the construction phase. But the interesting thing, I'll show the map. Wait, wait, wait. In the map, we can see that the pipeline is starting not in the field, it's starting in the middle of, of the end. So the only reason why this was possible is, and then, then it comes all the way to the plant, the natural gas. The only reason why this is possible is because the, the Kamisea project that was running parallel around here, the, the jungle portion, this is where the, the Andes start. And, and this is the coast, like the, the desert, the Andes, and here would be the rainforest. So all the rainforest portion of the Camisea pipeline was built with extra capacity so that in the projections that in five or 10 years, you wouldn't have to go back and dig again in the rainforest because it was a very difficult to build for the first time and secondly would avoid all the construction impacts. So the pipeline uses this extra capacity of the Camisea pipeline through the through through the rainforest. Okay, so that's how it was able to be built without going through the rainforest again. So on the, when we participated in this case we already had the bank already had approved the, the safeguards compliance policy. So basically we have a compliance uh, aspect, but we also, as a principle, we always want to go beyond compliance and to do good. So a lot of the lessons learned from the Camisea project, that was our first project, you know, uh, and that we took like three years to work through it. On the parts of the corridor monitoring, it was improved and enhanced, so they did the same thing for, their, for the pipeline. <laughs> On contractor, managing contractors, we had a lot of problems during Camisea because we were not involved in the loans by the time it was uh, being built. So now we, had, we knew 
what the problems were so we, we could work better with Perul and G. So Perul and G had really a very strong environmental, social health and safety management system. That was what really held it together. On the social investment plans, they, were exe they are exemplary um, investment plans and biodiversity um, action plans were really uh, state of the art. And on the construction methods that we had developed for Kamasea, they really improved it and made it even better. So for revegetation, erosion control, the, the pipeline, I don't know if there is anyone from the IFC who co-financed this project with us, we were really, really well impressed when we went to the field. It was everything very, very good. Uh, the additionality in this case was that the bank on the public sector win. We thought that it would be important to work with the government to help them design a new energy matrix because what they were doing so far was this one thing was coming after the other. They had no strategy. So that's what's going on now. Well, the, the government change and the new government is working with the, the IPB is working with the new government to develop a new energy matrix for them. Now that they know that they have huge reserves of, of natural gas. Uh, so we did some technical cooperation to, to support the, the, their efforts. And another important uh, support to the lower Lubamba, which is this area in the rainforest, where the, the natural gas fields are for both projects. And this is just some views of the, this is the breakwater, and, the, the, and here's the plant. So these are just views to just have a, an idea of how it looks like. Thank the pipeline. Some of the construction matters again. And so the conclusion for us is that it is really important for the multilateral development banks and particularly for the IDP to be involved because we can manage both windows and so we can uh, enhance or ensure the sustainability, ensure that the wires will be used in a way that will be um, provoking, like the, in the long term, a new development know, vision for the region and for the communities who, who are in the area. Uh, the other thing is that we can put some better protection than only if we leave the uh, government alone. We also have an important uh, participation throughout the life of the loan, which is long, it's long term. Our loans are on the 14 um, to 10 to 14 years. So during all this time, we do uh, monitoring on a frequent basis, it's like three times, four times a year during construction. Uh, we have two, at least two visits uh, every year. So it's a lot of, of, um, of leverage to ensure that by the time we go out of the project and the project is fully repaid, the system is so much space that it's, it's, it's impossible to go back. You know, we have to create already the environment that will, will carry the project along. And well, on the, the last thing that I was mentioning, like. Kamisea was really a very small portion of our loan to the project, but we were able to, to, to leverage this participation and include requirements of including for the upstream. So we really today we do monitoring of the whole project, both downstream and upstream. So it's, it's a really a, a very important thing. And I think this is the last one. Well, the lessons learned I already been more or less talked. And the only thing I would like to, to, to stress is the participatory monitoring. This is a key thing throughout, not only through starting the baseline, but also throughout the operation and, and duration of the loan. Um, yeah, well, and addressing the issues of mixed responsibilities. As we know, ensuring sustainability is not possible just from the private sector alone. We have had three parts, two other uh, presentations that kind of showed it. And this is a big one.
Namibia, and Tom Carr, the also very chair of the Boston Consultant Institute for Environmental Assessment in Namibia. And I invite all the past member presenters to come to the table and we'll just take questions. If there's anything that you haven't had a chance to ask questions or make comments, this is, uh, this is your opportunity. So I see the first hand there. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to apply your policies. And my question is that, although you only financed the pipeline, part of the chain, did the policy apply also to the upstream area, to the Amazon area? That one question. The other question is, why there were so many leaks in the pipeline? Okay, well, as I mentioned to you before, during the for the approval of the Common Stay project, we didn't have uh, an environmental and safe rest of policy approved. It was only approved in 2006. 